text, Ephesians 1, verse 3 through 14, as we have said before, is um, a, a text, is one sentence, 200 words long. Uh, it is filled with theology, filled with practical things. No commands or imperatives, instead telling us what God has done rather than focusing for us on what we ought to do, and yet it's filled with implications. Um, At the end of each stanza of this hymn, it says, to the praise of his glory, which is a pronouncement, not a command. But how can you read that and read the texts and not understand the implication, praise him, (laughs) And so though there are no specific uh, commands or imperatives in this text there, it's overflowing with implications for us as believers to worship and rest and to walk in the way that honors God as a result of this. The text, the sentence is Trinitarian. The whole book is, really the Bible is Trinitarian, but uh, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 18 has a very short Trinitarian verse, one of my favorite Trinitarian texts in the Bible because it, in a very short way, encourages us and encapsulates how our salvation is a triune work of God. Ephesians 2.18 says, through him, that's Christ, we have access by one spirit to the Father. And so you have all three persons of the triune God at work in saving sinners. But this sentence as well, the opening sentence in the book of Ephesians, is thoroughly Trinitarian. The first stanza, the divine Father chooses His people to the praise of His glory. The second stanza, the divine Son redeems the chosen people to the praise of His glory. And the third stanza that we're looking at today, the divine Holy Spirit seals the redeemed chosen ones to the praise of His glory. This is a eulogy, a high praise of God. But you know, imperfectly as it is, we are generally able to conceive of God as Father. Probably because we have some experience with fatherhood. As humans, we know what they are. Um, Good or bad, living or dead, we all had them. We understand a little bit about fatherhood, or some of us are fathers. And so when we think of God as Father, God the Father, oh yeah, there's something about that that makes some sense to us. We also are able in some way to conceive as God the Son and God incarnate. Not only because we have sons and there's children, our real our reality that we experience as humans, but even the fact that this person of the triune God became like us. So there is a certain, we definitely understand Jesus and the concept of who he is to some degree. But is it not true that when we come to describing God the Holy Spirit, we just sort of get fuzzy? Because we don't have really any physical experience in what it means for one to be a person, to be spirit. We believe it. We talk about it. We talk about our own spirits. We can't really identify even a location as to where those are. Um, What is the spirit? Where is it? We know we're spiritual beings. We sense this. But we really have a hard time explaining it. And thus, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, this third triune member of the Godhood is open to all sorts of individuals of fanciful explanations and interpretations because we just can't really wrap our minds around the Holy Spirit as well as we can, to a limited degree, Father and Son. Half of my sermon today is not going to be on Ephesians chapter 3, 1. Half of the sermon is going to be running through this doctrine of the Holy Spirit, I think that'll be okay, because these are only two verses, first of all, so it's not as long of a text. Some of you are already looking worried because you're already getting hungry. Um, I'll do my best. But I think it would be very helpful for us to sort of have some anchor points to think about the Holy Spirit and who the Bible reveals him to be, to and for us, 
in order to then follow that with, okay, so what then is the work of the Holy Spirit in sealing us as Christians? First of all, this anchor pointer peg for which to hang theology on. The Holy Spirit is revealed in the Bible as a person of the triune God, co-equal, co-eternal, and consubstantial. That means of the same essence, the same substance as God, with the Father and Son. When we speak, we are speaking of, of God, we are speaking of Father, Son, and Spirit, not Father, Son, and nebulous power or a force. We're speaking of a third person, and one of the proof texts, it could go through many of these, won't, one of the proof texts for this is what I've repeated several weeks now, Matthew 28, 19, when Jesus gives the command, he says, baptizing them, that's believers, disciples, in the name, singular, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If merely a divine power of the Father or the Son or something that just um, is a part of how they operated as spiritual beings, then it's senseless for Jesus to speak of the Holy Spirit in such terms in equality of personhood and activity as the Father and Son and necessary for uh, identifying a Christian baptism. He's a person with the Father, with the Son, and Jesus taught that. Furthermore, John 16, 13, Jesus is very clear that he, when he promises the presence of the Holy Spirit, which we're going to read in a little bit, that, the, that he promises that he, the Spirit of truth, will come to you and he will be with you. And the whole text is about he'll be with you as my substitute or in the same way that I'm with you. So maybe not physically, but the Holy Spirit then is described by Jesus as a person who will be present with Christians in a real, uh, in a real and genuine and equal way as Jesus' actual physical presence with them. You only say those things about persons, not ideas or concepts. It could go more, but that is enough, I think, to just sort of throw that out there, that it is an orthodox Christian doctrinal belief that the Holy Spirit is a person of the Godhead, equal to the Father and Son, essential in salvation, and really all of God's work. But I want to just run through a biblical theology of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to mention a lot of Scripture passages. If we read and read them, then we would be here until the youth meeting tonight. I won't be doing that. I have notes with them all written down. If you want these to go do your own study, I'd be glad to give them to you. I'm just going to reference and maybe read some of the texts of Scripture. The first time we meet the Holy Spirit in the pages of Scripture is in the, is in the beginning, Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. And then it says, and the Spirit hovered over the abyss. The first time we meet the Holy Spirit as a person of the divine triunity, he is active in creation. The scripture says that the Father speaks, then God says, let there be. The Word or the Son activates what is spoken. He does. He forms what is spoken. And the Spirit hovering or agitating, empowering, makes it so. And so creation is a triune work of God where Father, Son, and Spirit, too, are actively involved in this. And then a few uh, verses later in Genesis, on the sixth day, God fills the garden with humanity the Father speaks to the Son and the Spirit and says, let us make man in our image. Once again, you have a plural hour and a singular image, one God, three persons. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And so the Father speaks, the Son forms. And it says that when the Son forms, or, or Colossians 1 describes the Son as forming, not the Genesis passage. But as the sun is forming out of the earth and the dirt, it says that he breathes into him the breath of life, and man becomes a living soul. That word breath is the word ruach, which is the same exact word as spirit. He spirited in him the activation. 
Keep that in your mind because Jesus will later breathe on the disciples, receive the Ruach, the Spirit, just in creation and new creation. Job 33.4, Job says this, The Spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. Some time elapses in humanity. People sin and do some really bad stuff. It gets so wicked that there is only evil in man's heart, in man's thoughts, in man's activity, a planet populated with the fallen. And Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, describes this planet populated with the fallen, doomed to judgment because of pride and violence. And one of the words that God says about humanity in Genesis 6, 3 is, my spirit will not always strive with man, abide with him, Genesis 6, 3 indicating that up to this point, the Spirit of God had been very active in humanity, striving, convicting, abiding, urging, restraining, and they were refusing the Spirit, refusing and refusing the work of the Spirit in humanity. And so he says, so 120 years and it's all over for them. So the Spirit actively striving amongst humanity. Thousands of years later, well not thousands, thousand plus years later, a nation is formed by God. And he forms this nation, and this nation goes into captivity in Egypt, the nation of Israel. Turn to me to Isaiah 63, because I think this text would be helpful to, to read. Isaiah 63 is recounting this exodus. And I think it's, it's helpful to see the Spirit's work in the exodus. Isaiah 63, verse 8 People are in bondage. They want deliverance. This is why God remembered Israel and redeemed them from Egypt. Verse 8 of Isaiah 63. For he said, surely they are my people. Children will not lie. So he became their savior. He saved them. In their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. Side note, I believe that's speaking of a pre-incarnate Christ, a angel of the Lord, the angel of his presence, the second person of the Trinity. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them, and he bore them, bore them and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So he turned himself against them as an enemy, and he fought against them. And then he remembered the days of old, Moses and his people saying, where is he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he who put his Holy Spirit within them? I know that for those that have perhaps studied uh, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, there's sometimes people say that, uh, well, the Holy Spirit was so really sort of a New Testament concept. He really wasn't doing much until we get to the New Testament, the day of Pentecost. But according to Isaiah 63, the Holy Spirit indwelt God's people in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant. Indwelt them. His Spirit was within them. And they're asking, where is he? He's striving. He's guiding. He's leading. He's redeeming and regenerating them. You see, there's only one way to be saved. There only has ever been one way to be saved from our sins and judgment. It has always been through Jesus Christ's sacrifice. In the Old Testament, they were saved on credit that Christ purchased, and now we are saved on debits. The idea of looking forward, looking back on Christ alone. But you see, the energizing work of Christ to save us is given to us in the regeneration by the Holy Spirit of God. And there is only one way to be saved, and that is through the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. And so in the new covenant, under the new covenant, the Spirit regenerates people and they believe. And under the old covenant, the Spirit regenerated people and they believed. By the way, this is why Jesus is so surprised when he's talking to Nicodemus 
and he says, you're the teacher of Israel and you don't understand the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit that one must be born from the Spirit? If Jesus were talking about something yet to happen, then he would not have chided Nicodemus for being the teacher of Israel and not grasping it as a reality. The Holy Spirit was active regenerating his people and guiding his people and filling his people in the Old Testament. It doesn't mean that that filling looks the same as it does today, but the reality of what was happening is active in the Old Testament in redeeming and leading his people. Talking about leading his people, the people then get into the promised land that God had promised to them, and they are grieving the Spirit, as it says here, and they are turning from God's Spirit, and they are not following in the leading of the Holy Spirit as a nation, and they are being idol worshipers, and so they fall into captivity. He, God sends upon them different peoples and nations to come and judge them and chasten them. And in the book of Judges, we find them crying out, where is the one with whom he's put his spirit? Where, are the, where, where is God who has redeemed us? And so God in his mercy raised up judges. And the Bible says that these judges would deliver be, the people of Israel because they were empowered by the Holy Spirit. Samson and Gideon are described as empowered by the Holy Spirit. This is not the same as regenerated. It's not even the same as indwelt. It's the idea they were received the guidance and the power, sometimes miraculously, to do works to redeem or to save his people from their bondage. And so we have the book of Judges describing that in in just a very, uh, very, expressive way says over and over again judges 634 and in 1325 the holy spirit came upon the holy spirit came upon this is the meaning of the word anointed when you read that the holy spirit coming upon someone so the judges they are anointed and so they deliver god's people <clears throat> but the rule by judges turned to be ruled by kings And we find out that the same Holy Spirit empowered those kings. And so they were anointed with oil, symbolizing the Holy Spirit being poured out for service, for this kingly service. 1 Samuel 16, 13 describes David's anointing, that he is ready for service and the Holy Spirit came upon him. And then you have David, this great sinner in Psalm 51, after he had grieved the Spirit, pleading with God in his repentance not to take the Holy Spirit away from him. Once again, he wasn't seeking God to unregenerate him, not to unregenerate him as if that could be, but allow me to continue to serve you by the Spirit. Empower me as your king over the people. God sent prophets to warn the people to love and obey God. These prophets were not only empowered by the Holy Spirit, but forbidden from speaking God's name without the Holy Spirit expressly giving them the truths to speak. Micah 3.8 is a very powerful text where Micah says, I have the Spirit, and so therefore, I'm going to tell you something you're not going to like. And that was the spirit of the prophets. Of course, the New Testament actually describes this. In 2 Peter chapter 1, 20, it says that the, the prophecies of the old, or the prophets, uh, their prophecies were not of private interpretation. No prophecies of private interpretation or private. They didn't make it up. Rather, holy men of God spoke, prophets, as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So actively Uh, and scripturating word, God's word to people. The words of God conveyed via the Holy Spirit through human minds and hands. But as numerous as the ministry of the Holy Spirit was in the past, many Old Testament texts prophesy that something greater would happen yet to be. As numerous, and, and this is an important theological point. The ministry of the Holy Spirit under a new covenant is not a radically different ministry. He's the same Spirit doing the same work of redemption and guiding and convicting and striving and encouraging and all those sorts of things. It's an expansive and expounding on his ministry in a greater and more full way. Just as the ministry of the Messiah, the Christ, in prophecy, 
is not something that was unheralded in the Old Testament, but it's fulfilled, it's expanded, it's expounded now when God becomes flesh. And so something bigger is happening, but not something different, not something completely unique and unprecedented. We talked last week about the concept of mystery. It's kind of in that same concept. There's these incremental pointing towards something that then has an expansion in it in this first century. For example, in the Old Testament, in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2 and 42, 1, it describes that the Messiah would be the final and ultimate anointed one that the Spirit of God would rest upon him. As we read this morning in even our text of Scripture, that the Spirit of God would rest on Jesus, the Holy Spirit. He would not only empower Old Testament leaders, but all regenerate believers. In Joel 2, 28 through 29, a prophecy that that would take place. An expansion and an expounding of Old Testament ministry rather than the revision of his work. And so at just the right time, as the Holy Spirit hovered over the waters of creation, a Holy Spirit hovered over the womb of a virgin, and she miraculously conceived the human body, the nature, human nature of the divine eternal Son, Jesus. And she was conceived by the Holy Spirit, it says. When 33 years or 30 years old, as the Father spoke from heaven, the Spirit visibly empowered Christ at his baptism to be recognized as the true and better judge to rescue his people. Now empowered by the Spirit to do that, the true and better prophet to guide his people the true and better king to rule his people, and the true and better priest to sacrifice for his people. Interestingly, each one of those roles, the Old Testament describes as spiritually empowered, anointed roles. Each one of those were anointed, and the Holy Spirit empowered for that task. And Jesus fulfills each one of those roles by the empowering of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, we see this, then he empowered Jesus to withstand temptation in Matthew 4, 1. Empowered Jesus to sacrifice himself for our sins. Hebrews 9, 14 says that he offered himself by the eternal spirit. And Romans chapter 8, verse 11 says that the Holy Spirit empowered Jesus to raise himself from the dead. So the entire work of Jesus' ministry was amazingly unique, something we can't even understand and explain because we are not a, a person with two distinct natures as Jesus was, a human nature and divine nature. But that's another subject, another time. But the idea that he had his spirit, he was indeed a human with a human spirit like we are, but he also had the Holy Spirit empowering upon him this ministry of the gospel. John chapter 3. Jesus, as I said before, chides Nicodemus, the teacher of Israel, for not understanding the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit. And not, not just the regenerating promise, but the power of it. You, you, this, you know that no man enter the kingdom of heaven without being born again. What do you mean born again? Born of above, born of the Spirit. No man enters the kingdom of God without being born of the Spirit. Not no man now, but no man ever. And this was prophesied. It was told over and over again in the Old Testament. And he comes to Nicodemus and he not only chides him, but he um, gently chides him, but he also teaches us very clearly that this will be and is the primary and most significant work of the Holy Spirit in the church today. That he's actually birthing the church. He's birthing the people of God. Everyone who is a true believer is only a true believer in Christ because the Spirit of God has regenerated him, given him life, born of the Spirit. But that's not the only ministry of the Holy Spirit today in the church. The same sort of things. Not only does he regenerate, but he also guides. How does he guide? Well, not only was the Old Testament Scriptures that which was individuals being carried along by the Spirit of God, but 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All Scripture 
old and new, is theopneustos, God-breathed or God-spirited, the work of the Holy Spirit. How does he guide? We'll look at it later in Ephesians, at the end of the book of Ephesians, where he says, well, the weapon, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. It's the sword, it's its weapon, it's what he uses. And he, he cuts, and he divides, and he penetrates the thoughts and the, and, the, and the ideas of humanity and as believers. And he says, this is how you walk. And the Spirit with the Word illuminates and empowers and encourages. The reason why people, Christians, obey, obey the Word of truth is because the Spirit energizes them to obey it, to know it, to believe it. It's not of their own intellect and their own abilities. It's the Spirit of God who is doing a spiritual, supernatural work in guiding. He promised this in John 14, 16 through 18, and John 16, 5 through 15. I want to read this because this is precisely what... Um, uh, Paul is talking about in our text of Scripture in Ephesians, the promised Holy Spirit. In uh, John 14, we'll look there first. John 14, verse 16. Jesus tells the disciples, um, And I will pray the Father, and He will give you another helper, a parakletos, one who comes next to, one who comes aside that he may abide with you forever. Who is this? The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. They're not regenerated. Whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. How did he dwell with them at that point? Um, Jesus is empowered by the Spirit. He says, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. I thought he said he was leaving. I will come to you via the Holy Spirit. He is my presence with you. And then in verse chapter 16, a few chapters over, Jesus comforting him again in verse 5 of John 16 says, But now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, but if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. And the immediate context is the people, is, are the disciples, the apostles, Right? However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, or it is heard of the Father or the Son, and he will tell you the things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. And what is happening here is Jesus is essentially promising the apostles, first to the apostles, to that immediate generation, that you will write the scripture. The Holy Spirit will tell you all the truth. And then as Peter says, as Timothy says, the Spirit of God will now... Um, it'll be God-breathed when you write the Scriptures, when you speak the truths, like the prophets of the old, the apostles in the new. Thus, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, the word of truth, the Spirit's word. The secondary application, that's the first application of this. This is primarily application of this text is not that anything you've ever wondered, you, 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 you pray, you say, God, what's that mean? And suddenly you get this audible voice or you get a sign or something happens and he tells you every truthful thing you ever wanted to know. It's not what this is speaking of. This is speaking primarily of the inscripturation of the word of truth, that it's putting the apostles in the same line as the prophets as it relates to their receiving from God the truths concerning Christ that they will then teach to the rest of us. So it's about the word of God. The secondary application here is that through the Spirit's word, 
we then are guided into everything that is true. We have the truth of God. We have the presence of Jesus in the Spirit's word. That's what he is saying to them. The way in which this will be different than the Old Testament, I said it's not a new work, it's, a, um, it's an expanded, or a, it's not unique when I mean new, it's, a, not expand, it's an expanded or expounded on ministry, is God did uh, indwell people in the Old Testament to fill them for service, but it was, generally speaking, select people that he did this for, for particular reasons, and then he would sometimes leave that person. The regeneration ministry is the same, but the presence, the presence to guide and protect was given to individuals at God's direction under the old covenant for purposes to lead his people. The promise of Jesus is all that's now done. Everyone will receive the presence of the Holy Spirit to guide them and to empower them. And thus, we have the doctrines that we hold dear, especially as Baptists, of the individual priests before God, the priesthood of every believer. Why? The individual soul liberty. Why? Because the Spirit of God, we believe, dwells in every believer equally, empowering and guiding through the Word of God for service and obedience and righteousness. And that's the biggest, you might say, shift in the work of the Holy Spirit, which was signaled... First, in John 20, 22, Jesus is resurrected. He looks at his disciples and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. And then he breathes on them. Echoing Genesis chapter 1, a new humanity, a new creation. This new humanity will have Christ as its new Adam. And it will be filled with the Spirit as Man was breathed with the Spirit in the beginning. And then it's evidenced, this indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit is evidenced about 10 days later from this, when the people are gathered in a room in Jerusalem, people from all over are there, and there begins to be some preaching and teaching, but what's even bigger than that is a miraculous, expressive work of the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of God now fulfills this promise and descends upon everyone in the church. Not just the apostles, but everyone then receives the Spirit of God. And they all speak in languages that they did not know before, it says. And little tongues of fire representing God's powerful work rests upon all of them. And the unique thing about this is there were several hundreds of people and there was no uh, gender distinctions as to who received the Spirit. There was no ethnic distinctions who received the Spirit. These were Jewish people, but they were from all over, speaking all sorts of languages. Well, that was stage one of the fulfillment or the expression of this promise. Stage two happens a little bit less dynamically, but yet none, still quite uh, miraculously, in Acts chapter 9, verse 31, the disciples begin preaching in Caesarea outside Judaism. And what happens there is a Gentile receives the gospel, and the Gentiles then receive the Spirit the same way that the Jews did at Pentecost. And so now it's the undoing of the Tower of Babel. The separation of the, of the tongues and the people. It's like, no, 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 now one family with one head, one Adam, and one spirit empowering all of you. And this only continues in the book of Acts. And then you get to Ephesus, our location. Acts 19.6, a final display in the book of Acts of this same thing. When the uttermost part of the earth, the Gentiles in Ephesus, in the center of the Roman Empire, the civilization of the West, receive the Holy Spirit in the same way as Caesarea and um, it, Jerusalem. And this is a big picture that the promise is here, the Spirit is here, and it's for all of you. It's for all of you. We, the people of God, are the kings and priests and judges as Christ as our chief king, priest, judge. 
That's the promise of the Holy Spirit, the expanding and expounding of his work. So the summation of this ministry of the Holy Spirit, I'm actually impressed with myself. I did that whole thing in a, in a short period of time, relatively speaking. The Holy Spirit is a divine person within the one divine nature. The character, nature, essence of the Father, Son is true of the Holy Spirit. God is love. Son is love. Spirit is love. Understand that's what we're saying by that. He has a distinctive ministry, work that begun under crea in creation under the old covenant, empowered the Christ, and has flourished and expanded under the new covenant of grace unto and for the church. Jesus promised that he would be present with us to regenerate, empower, encourage, and guide. The Father is in heaven, and so is Christ the Son. But God sent the Holy Spirit with us. And it is to our advantage because now the presence of God, the, the, the righteous presence of God, the perfect presence of God is in and for and upon every believer. Eternal help, eternal comfort. He's fulfilled that promise. And so the big question that we're now facing in our text in Ephesians is, are you sealed with that spirit? Are you sealed with that spirit? Half of the uh, sermon was not about our text. You see, God has not only promised to give his people his divine spirit as their eternal help and comfort. But he's fulfilled that promise, and it says in our text that those who have heard and believed are sealed with the Spirit. Very simple concept today. One main verbal idea. You were sealed. Not a question. Will I be sealed? Will I receive? You were sealed. It is important, though, that we take slow down for a moment and look at the text and ask the question and answer it, when is someone sealed by the Holy Spirit or with the Holy Spirit? Paul writes, in whom, that's in Christ, you also, there is a shift here. He's been saying us to this point, he shifts grammatically and says you, particularly about the Ephesian believers in the first context. Some think that he's saying you Gentiles as well as us Jews, but that doesn't really fit the whole thing of what he's talking about. Some think he means you Ephesian or you believers as, as, as well as us apostles. That could be as well, but he doesn't seem to be drawing distinctions in this whole context between apostles and everyone else. It seems to me that the reason he shifts is not some major theological point. It's the, we might call the uh, a, a preacher's shift. Um, it's, it's fine to be saying I, I, we, we, but then it's different when the preacher says, but you, it's personal. You were sealed. Think about that is what he is saying. Personalize it. You were sealed. I, I don't want to just sit here and talk about what I have. I want to talk about what you have. You were sealed. You also. In whom also you. The in whom is in Christ in the context. In Christ, in Christ. And there's also some debate or some discussion as what's going on here. Because in the Greek language, this is really grammatically awkward. It's, that's why I, you see in maybe, the, I think it's the New King James. Different translations translate differently. The New King James says, you also trusted. And that's put like in parentheses. Um, it's because literally Paul trails off his sentence. He's like, in whom you also, uh, after having heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, in whom also you, he's, he's sort of like trailing off and people are trying to understand grammatically what he's doing there. But I think the clearest expression of what he's doing here is that he is having a, a moment and he's writing that moment down and that moment is, wow, you too, let that sink in. Let me repeat myself, you too. 
And that's what he does here. He repeats it. He's sort of uh, interrupting himself with these thoughts. And, and one of those things is the temporal element, when or after. When or after, as both could be translated there in that text there, having heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, and after having believed, you were sealed. In other words, I believe the in first in whom you also, in whom also the second one is the same, in whom you were sealed, in whom you were sealed. But he gives this temporal element. When you heard and believed the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. This should answer the question, does everyone have the possession, the sealing, the presence of God's Holy Spirit? And the answer is no, because the apostle is clear, after having heard, after having believed. This isn't the main point of the text, but I thought this was a very important uh, sub-point. The necessity of hearing and believing the gospel. The word of truth or the truthful word, which is the gospel that saves you. In other words, many words claim to save you. Many words, many religions, many experiences promise you salvation. But this one is truthful. It's genuine. It actually saves your soul, and that's what makes it good news. That's what he's saying there. So the gospel... But think about how important it is to hear the true gospel in order to experience salvation. Because individuals, people, can believe something they've heard their whole life. And yet if it isn't the word of truth, if it isn't the gospel of Christ, their faith does not save them. Hearing the true gospel is essential to salvation. But not just hearing the true gospel is essential to salvation. Hebrews chapter 4 tells us the danger of a people who heard the word of truth. And I'm directing this to all of us, but I want to specifically direct this to the young men and young women and the children in our church. Hebrews chapter 4 says that the children of Israel heard and saw everything that God had done in Exodus and in the wanderings, but they entered not into God's rest because their hearing was not mixed with believing. And young people, children, you can grow up in a church hearing the gospel every week, the true gospel. You can grow up in a family hearing the true gospel every day. But unless you mix that hearing with faith, with believing, it is not the gospel. It will not save your souls as this gospel is. His point or a sub-point, when you heard and when you believed, the danger to many people, the warning is to ask the question, am I hearing the true gospel or am I believing the true gospel? Because that's essential. But the question to many who grow up in Christian environments is not necessarily, am I hearing the true gospel, but am I believing the true gospel? Don't just be a hearer of the word. Be a doer, a believer of it. But when one does hear and believe the true gospel, the promise of God is this, you are sealed. Now, what does it mean to be sealed? So, it's important to understand that the dative with the Holy Spirit is not 
the idea that the Holy Spirit does the work of an active work of sealing someone. It's passive. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit. In other words, rather than think of the Holy Spirit, if you're using some silly illustration, rather than think of the Holy Spirit as the one like stamping people, it's, it's, the Holy Spirit is the stamp. It's the, he's the seal um, that is being imprinted upon those who believe the word of truth. So in this instance, though he has an active ministry, regeneration is an active ministry, guiding is an active ministry, the sealing is a more of a passive ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's something that he is to you. He is for you from God. So you were sealed when you believed. You were stamped with the Holy Spirit of promise. The word seal, it's interesting to me because in the Septuagint and in classical Greek, these words used for seal even go back further in the Old Testament Hebrew. What we think of sealing is actually what they were thinking of sealing. There's no like, well, what does this mean then? And what does it, mean? it means the same thing. And there are three primary ways that the Greeks talked about, the, used this word for sealing. Um, and, and I think these three apply to the believer. The first way they used it is to secure something, to seal it up. Remember um, when they buried Jesus' body and they said, go seal up the tomb? Same word used here, go seal up the tomb, make it secure. Close it so that nobody can get in and nobody can get out. That's the idea of a sealing. Or you might seal a jar. You might, um, you might seal up by putting a chain around a refrigerator so you can keep your diet or whatever you do. You know, like you're trying to seal things. Make it secure. Make it to where it, nothing can, can change it. That's one of the uses of the word seal. The presence of the Holy Spirit in you and on you, Christian, protects you. First, it protects you from the domain of, of Satan and the devil. He might influence. This world might tempt you and draw you. But Satan cannot have you. Cannot have you. Because you are sealed. You are protected. You are shut up from the wicked one. This world cannot have you. Jesus says that in salvation that we have a divinely tight-gripped, two-fisted security. Because we are given to the Son by the Father, we're in His hands. No one can take that. And because it's from the Father, if we're in the Father's hands, no one can take that. And the Spirit, this is not the Bible, this is my illustration, sort of wraps that up with unbreakable tape. We're secured. Satan can't have us. When I fear my faith will fail, he will hold me fast. You know how I know that? Because the Spirit of God protects me. He keeps me. We are sealed. We are secured. The second use of the word seal is certified. To certify as authentic. You, we might use it today. A seal of approval. A brand logo. An imprint. Um, they did this in old times, they do this in today, they brand livestock. They certify them with their mark to say, this is, this is certified, it's good, it's genuine. The Holy Spirit is our seal of authenticity. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, um, meekness, and self-control. The fruit means the evidence. That's, that's what the mark looks like. That's what the authenticity looks like. The seal of genuine faith, incrementally and continually driven deeper into us. Imagine, if you will, that this Holy Spirit is like the brand of God, the image of God, the image of Christ pressed into you, but unlike other brands with over time they deteriorate and fade and you sort of get grown over with hair and this brand goes deeper and deeper and deeper and covers the entirety of the livestock. The brand, the seal of authenticity for the believer 
grows and spreads as the fruit of the Spirit is bearing more and more fruit incrementally, increasingly over time, we look more and more like Jesus because we've been sealed with the same Spirit that empowered Jesus. And probably the primary expression of seal in this text is owned. We are owned. A ruler, usually a ruler, would often have a personal mark or a family crest, and this was his seal. Official documents was the king's possession marked with the seal. God sent the Holy Spirit to the believer to mark us as adopted and redeemed sons and daughters, his heirs. We bear the family crest of Jesus and that crest is the Holy Spirit. This is, I think, the primary meaning of the, the point of sealing. Notice the child heir language throughout this. And the believer is no longer a slave to sin and death, but an adopted child of the living God. But what if it doesn't feel like that always? What if I forget? Or what's worse, what if he forgets? Paul closes this sentence with an illustration that essentially is him saying, he won't and he can't. You see, it's the same principle as today as it was 2,000 years ago. When an individual wants to prove that he's truly interested in something, that it's his, and he's, let's say, going to make a purchase of a very large piece of property, uh, you know, 100 acres of prime real estate, millions of dollars at stake here, you can understand why in a situation like that, um, the, the seller is like, but how do I know that you're not going to like maybe go through all this, I take it off the market, I do all these things, and then you're like, you know what, I changed my mind, I don't want it after all. How do you know about this? Well, there's a process that we have that they had in the first century as well. If you've ever bought a house or had any sort of dealings with that, you know how this works. You put down a payment toward the purchase of that property. It's not a pledge. A pledge usually was something that was rescinded. Afterward, you got back like a, like a deposit. This isn't a deposit. This is, we, we call earnest money or down payment money, and the idea there is that it's a part of the purchase price. It's a part of what you're going to have. So if there's like you're really interested and it's a very, very heavy, uh, like a really pr- a property that everyone wants and you've got the highest offer out there and the, and the, owner, uh, the owner wants to sell it to you, he's like, yeah, but what are you going to give me for earnest money? And you're like, you know what? I'll give you, it's a $40 million property. I'll give you $10 million. He's going to be like, like cash? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you got it. I'm not going to sell this to anyone else because you've paid the down payment, a significant down payment. Before you've even taken possession of it, you've paid a significant down payment. I know you're serious. I know you're not going to leave 10 million sitting on the table. Jesus ascended and went to heaven and said, I'm coming back for you. Really? Are you sure? It's been a couple thousand years. If he's forgotten, no, no. The Holy Spirit, he's my earnest money. He's my down payment. You get him, and you will have him, the presence of God, forever. He's a part of the inheritance. He's not the whole of the inheritance. He's a part of it. And you get that part of it right now. You get the very presence of God right now. So you know, I'm not going to leave you because I'm not going to leave my Holy Spirit. The only way for God to abandon one who has believed the gospel is if he abandons the Holy Spirit. And if God abandons his own triune person, he is no God at all. And so there is no way that a believer can be abandoned or forgotten by the one who has redeemed him. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee, the arabon, the earnest money, the down payment, the assurance, whatever word you want to say and translate from that. Until, until he redeems of the redemption of the purchased possession. I thought we already had redemption. Um, redemption has two sides to it, two points to it. There is the release And ransom paid for my soul to forgive me and to bring me into his family. 
But I am still waiting, as are all of you, for the release of this body into the resurrected, glorified, perfected body to come. And until that day, may it be soon, until that day, until we enter into the inheritance of our home forever, the Holy Spirit, the mark of God upon us, incrementally deepening His imprint on us, protecting us, is present Christian on you until that day. So what do we do with this? Well, first, I read it a couple times, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. He's there for you. He's the mark of God upon you. So be guided by the Spirit and the Word. Two, be assured that God is for you. The Spirit of God is proof of that and His presence amongst His people. And three, lift your eyes up because we are